Hello, and thank you for joining us. Now, if you're all sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived a man named John. Everybody loves a good story, don't they? Sadly, this isn't Jack and Ori, but we are here today to talk about how important storytelling is, particularly when it comes to cyber security awareness. Now, my children, they're of the age where they've been learning at school about what makes a good story, a challenge or a conflict or, or a journey that can help to make a plot, that sort of thing. They call them story elements. Now, I find that fascinating because as adults, it's very easy for us to take stories for granted, isn't it? And yet I find it really refreshing to revisit what it is that makes a story work, what, it makes, what makes a story resonate and stick in our minds. Because of course, being able to embrace those storytelling principles can really pay dividends when it comes to all kinds of communications, particularly when we want a message to stick with our audience. And that is exactly what we'll be exploring here today. Now, one of those story elements is the hero. And guess what? I'm joined by not one, but two heroes today. And just to confuse me, they're both called Robert. This had never happened in Hollywood. So please give a warm welcome to Med Compliance CEO, Robbie O'Brien and regional manager for UK and Ireland, Robert Pickett. Hello, Robbie and Robert. Thank you for joining us. Hello, David. Hello, David. Thank you for having us. I hope you're all ready for this cyber story time. Robbie, I'll come to you first. What was your favorite story while you were growing up and why? I was a, a hobbit and Lord, Lord of the Rings geek. I just love that uh, concept of heading off on a journey and uh, the different aspects that, that um, happened to people at that point in time. I, I suppose it was a hankering of, of, of getting, you know, being young, getting started with your life. So mm. uh, it starts out, you know, more or less once upon a time. I think it's, you know, once upon, uh, very, very much a, a, a point in time where you, you never know where you're going to go with it. it it's quite um, uh, counterintuitive. So that was my favorite. Yeah, mother of all journeys in, in yeah. a way. Uh, yeah, t terrific stuff. Uh, Robert, uh, what about your favorite movie? That, that's quite an easy one for me. Um, my, my favorite movie would be the, the film Inception. Mm. And it's, it's probably a little bit embarrassing to admit this. I've probably watched it somewhere in the region of about 30 times. Oh, wow. Inception's one of those films where I went to see it at the cinema uh, and I enjoyed it so much at the time that I said, right, I'm not going to watch this for a couple of years again, just so I forget enough about it so that when I come back to watch it one more time, then it'll still be fresh and a surprise. So just, just tell me what it is to just remind me. It's something to do with dreams, isn't it? It is. Essentially, there's a big business battle going on. And in the Inception world, what you can do is get into people's dreams, manipulate mm -hmm. their thought process and ideally have them make a decision in the real world, which you have essentially planted in their head in a dream state. Mm, there are parallels there to what we're talking about today, aren't there? There very much is. It, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite easy to link it to awareness because I think what you're trying to do with any awareness campaign for it to be successful is plant an idea in people's heads, in their subconscious thoughts that will ultimately result in a decision in whatever the circumstance may be. Yeah that is the correct one. So making sure that as they go about their personal and professional lives, when the moment of truth comes and their decision is what is going to determine the outcome, that they have that information in the mental Rolodex to, to act accordingly. Right, I'm, I'm gonna hold you there because uh, this is exact. In fact, you're doing, you're doing the inception thing because you're planting some ideas that we're gonna be visiting uh, later on in this conversation. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for sharing both of those stories. And you know, as you say, that they're stories that, that resonate with you and they, and they stick with you for, for a reason really. Um, Robbie, when it comes to storytelling in, in the workplace, particularly around cyber awareness, what are the challenges? the big challenge is relevance. Um, a lot of people see the problems associated with cybersecurity as someone else's problems. It'll never happen here. It, I mean, what, 
what do I have that is of any value to cyber criminals? Um, what is in my organization? And, and, and it's really a, a, an area that in the past people have been able to claim plausible deniability, but really what we're trying to do and the biggest challenge is make them connect, get some sort of em emotional connection. Um, and I think for that, you have to provide them with awareness, content and training that talks to the role, um, talks to the personal challenges that they might have, as in um, we can all mess up in our own private lives from a security perspective and people around us, kids, um, elderly parents can get easily um, scammed because they're not as tuned in, they're not in the workplace. And so it, it, if you can connect, for example, people's private lives to their corporate lives, it makes it so much easier to make this relevant to them. It's also complex material sometimes that you're talking about. And, you know, it's easy for, for techies to understand, to grasp some, you know, techie talk, which is often what cyber stuff can be. But very often you're talking to uh, a, a workforce or members of a workforce who are not necessarily so tech literate and it's trying to make that as accessible as possible so that they can then build that resonance with it so they can connect with it totally i mean the other aspect of it is it's a boring subject uh on the face of it um if you had asked me what my favorite film was i would have said uh the godfather i i love the journey of the character from being this uh, uh, naive, uh, sensitive character through to being the, 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 the kingpin. That was of its time in the, the 40s when you had criminals, you know, putting horses' heads in people's bed to get it. Yeah. What is one of the big uh, movements in cybercrime at the minute is uh, using ransomware to get into executives' uh, laptops or computers and then trying to find uh, sensitive information to blackmail both the company and the individuals. So nothing has changed. Um, and so I think it's a complex, ever-changing dynamic. Um, and, and when you can get people to click with it, you reduce the chances of it occurring in your organization substantively. But where you have people that are not connected, but either emotionally or uh, in terms of the consequences, uh, you are running huge risks, and and people are dis. I mean, in any walk of life, people are difficult to manage, uh, and and cybersecurity is just particularly very difficult when it comes to people. In the in the setup, you know, I, I cast you both as as heroes in a story, mm -hmm. and you know, heroes and villains are there for a reason. You know, heroes viewers empathise with a hero. The, the 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 more we do empathise with them, the more that we invest, the more that we engage, the more that we go on the journey with them. To come back to your Hobbit example, um, so Robert. How can you encourage your audience to emotionally invest when it comes to a potentially unemotive subject like cyber awareness training where there isn't a dashing Tom Cruise or uh, Leonardo DiCaprio or, or whoever kind of, you know, taking us through that journey? I, I think uh, that Robbie mentioned upon a key point, which is you need to make an emotional connection. But the trap that I often see organizations fall into is that they replace storytelling and, re and relatability with big numbers. So they might inform their staff that a global titan of industry has been fined a billion pounds or a million pounds. And that number doesn't connect. The average employee would be more concerned that a student loan, or a student has had their student loan stolen mm -hmm. or that someone fell victim to a Lonely Hearts scam or that someone lost their deposit when purchasing their house. So what you have to do when you're communicating with the user is try and make sure that the user understands that this is for their personal and professional benefit. It's no point going to the user and speaking about the risk to the organization without helping them understand that the risk is as much relevant in their home life, their family's home life, as it is in the office. Yeah, it's about, it's about making it 
relatable. Uh, and I know when I'm writing as a as a journalist, not only about cybersecurity, but about whatever the story is about, throwing big numbers around. On the one hand, you know, you might think, oh, it's a big number. It's really impressive. But very often those those stories resonate best when we pitch those big numbers in a way that means something that that will be more relatable you know it's uh, you know that's the average salary of 200 people or, or whatever it is to make it a little bit closer to home than just a big number floating around in the in the cloud somewhere and it's not just the the money that's at, that's at stake the money clearly is a vital part of what an organization is trying to protect but it's your corporate pride, your corporate reputation. And I know that can impact the share price. You know, I'm not trying to dismiss the importance of that. But just as general employees, you want to represent your organization the best you can. And that means put in place the appropriate behaviors that you need to do to make sure that you personally have not done something which could have negative ramifications for yourself and the wider organization. I guess that's, uh, you know, corporate pride, a, a collective responsibility. There's lots of examples throughout history, you know, where, where we've seen people shoulder to shoulder feeling a kind of sense of collective responsibility and not wanting to let someone else on their side, their country, their company down. Absolutely. And it's almost like it's, 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 a, it's a war we're facing at the moment. You know, it's a cyber warfare, it's modern tactics and techniques. But increasingly and commonly, we see organizations invoke wartime messaging. Your organization needs you to play your part. This will probably, we can discuss this further, that might resonate with certain elements of the user demographic more than others who are familiar with the origins of such saints. But it's important to vary the message. And one of the messages we commonly see is that it's us against them. Let's stick together throughout this. So I, I can see, you know, this thing about, particularly with corporate cybersecurity awareness programs, it's about understanding that, that, that character of the company. If you're wanting people to feel that sense of corporate pride, it's understanding what that character is and turning, tuning into its personality, its values, and, and how the workforce would chime with those. But Robbie, I guess it's, it's an easy trap to fall into to misgauge that personality, not understand the, the company, the workforce, or worse still, assume a generic one-size-fits-all approach is, is going to work? I think we as consumers of content, of knowledge, um, are very sophisticated these days. Um, I think if someone is looking to do something uh, change a battery on a car, um, you know, fix a particular, uh, I, I, my Nespresso machine is playing up. How do, how do you, uh, you know, uh, do that? The first place you go is YouTube and you get some guy on there w w showing you how to do it. In reality, uh, what happens is you, you, you watch enough to work out what you, you need and then you, you go do. So what people have in their homes and in their personal life is actually quite sophisticated means of communication. You have to think that the organization has to deal with um, delivering something of, of similar value. I think also, you know, the one size fits all uh, immediately turns people off because if technical people receive uh, messaging that is meant for a finance department they basically um, reject that and, and it's almost impossible them to get them back on the bus. Um, mm. So when we're developing training, there's a lot of thought goes into uh, what is the outcome? What is a, the, 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 the learning objective that we're trying to meet here? Um, it was interesting um, that, uh, you know, the more boring the subject, the harder it is. So, we were working uh, recently on, uh, we're just about to complete Brazilian data protection law, which is um, uh, LGBT, which is the Lei Generale Proteção de Dados. Very good. Which, thank you very much. And so uh, even, even that, uh, our guys who were doing it in English had LGB, LGBT throughout, but it, they were doing it for different languages, but 
what they didn't do was actually put in the a that it, what the LGPD meant, and then b to say it was a Brazilian data protection. So there are so many traps that you you can fall into in terms of how you get your your information across. And indeed, they didn't tune into the fact that these regional regulations and indeed cybersecurity is almost a national pride thing. Um, and so it wasn't working until we started bringing um, Brazilian influences, Brazilian flag, Brazilian concepts. Mm. And, the, and, the, and actually what I did for the development team was to say, check out what happened during the, the World Cup and look at the images that the World Cup, which was a national representation of, of that country's uh, view of themselves, how, that's how they see themselves and incorporate that. Um, and, and after that, the, the actual communication um, flew. So imagine you're, if you were, we hadn't have done that, you would be getting a Brazilian person getting a fairly stale uh, piece of training on a stale subject. Um, and, and you're making fairly basic uh, national mistakes, it, 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 you would reject it. So for example, if, that, if we had have translated that course into European Portuguese, as opposed to Brazilian mm -hmm. Portuguese, immediately th there would be a, a, a rejection by people. So I think it's the responsibility of the authors of the training, but also the people that Ha, have the responsibility to ensuring that compliance is, is seen to and there's oversight to provide training and awareness that, again, makes the user connect to it and makes it easy for the user to step over. Like, don't have any own goals here. Uh, don't, don't make it that you have these negative feelings towards the, 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 the training in the first instance. Um, yeah. And so if you take uh, the person's role, if you take the person's locality, uh, their language, and then ultimately their national symbols, it shows you that th there is a lot of thought that needs to go in to actually get that resonance to happen. But when it happens, it's magic. And you, you do move the needle. But I think as we move forward on all the all our journeys with uh, protecting our staff um, and keeping our corporate assets safe, then you have to uh, compete in an arms race with the cyber criminals and double down on things like storytelling, uh, things like uh, producing really um, digestible content for your staff. Because you can bet that the cyber criminals, if they're you know going for a really, really targeted attack, they will research who it is they're going after, that they, they will tailor that attack to the individual or, or to the group. So when you are preparing cybersecurity awareness training, you need to play them at their own game to meet them where they're at, to make sure that you're putting up uh, as strong a defense as possible against those targeted attacks. I was talking to one of um, our clients uh, during the week and they said, we look at it like this, um, this is the first time in history that the people defending behind the fortifications are in a weaker position than the people attacking. Because normally you have all these fortifications, you have all these things to, to get through, but the nature of the cyber threat is that the, um, all the resources, the time, the, and, you know, the, the deep intelligence and the intent is, is very much with the attackers. And it's, it's forever. It's not like they're going to go away uh, and, and try, you know, try somewhere else. You know, their army is going to walk on. This is going to be for, they're going to be, you're under siege forever here. I think the Brazil examples, are, it, it really brings home what we're talking about. Um, and of course, the way you tell it is an is a example of good storytelling in its own right. But, but Robert, you know, a meta compliance, you engage with customers all over the world. And isn't one of the challenges that, you know, we're talking about, uh, about getting to know the individuals, about getting to know the companies, about getting to know their culture, is, is one of the challenges really that the only people who know the company as, uh, as well as they might 
is the company themselves. No one knows the company and their workforce as well as the company and its workforce knows itself. Uh, absolutely, David. It's, it's a huge challenge, but if we look at it from a positive point of view, it's absolutely a huge opportunity as well. Um, the clients that we work with correctly and understandably know their culture better than anyone else. They know the way they like to communicate with their staff. They know how their staff members will respond to certain types of communications. And we think it represents a fantastic opportunity to work with the client to make sure that their cyber awareness program is aligned with their individual corporate culture. And how we do that in a, in a practical sense is that we allow a lot of customization, some of it really simplistic, but unbelievably effective. So many of our clients have got really inspirational CEOs. What we try to do in such occasions is try to get a short window of the CEO's time, have them explain why cyber awareness is so important, have them help their staff members and colleagues better understand that this has got senior leadership attention and that is to be taken seriously. So the cultural challenge from a language perspective, from making sure that the story resonates, not just in English, but in every single language, is significant and requires careful attention. But the opportunity itself, if you can make sure that your awareness program is in sync with your corporate culture, it has a dramatic effect on the, on the end users when they're asked to participate. We're, we're talking about making sure that the messaging is tailored to the workforce. But I wonder if we need to be more granular than that, because, you know, you've got different profiles within an organization and references that might strike a chord with a with a Gen Z will be different to those that will resonate with someone who's worked for the company for, for 30 years. Absolutely. And there was actually a fantastic example. Um, you'll forgive me, I won't be gracing you with a rendition, although what I've seen in one of our clients recently was you might have seen the sea shanty phenomenon on TikTok and social media, where what their awareness team did was they got a lot of their staff members to basically do a rendition of the sea shanty song with the lyrics changed to represent cyber attacks, cyber threats, and cyber awareness, and it had an unbelievable impact. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue in his It gone, went viral we'll on their social media challenge. The people that participated might have showed their friends, their families, their colleagues. So people went from taking a very low level of interest in this subject matter to taking a massive interest to the extent they felt pride in actually sharing this. And it was for a very low cost investment. They, they were able to do this using Zoom calls and piecing it together to the sea shanty music. It's a key message. Awareness does not need to be excessively expensive. It needs to be creative and memorable and invoke the correct decisions and outcomes and the participants and, and the viewers. I also think uh, that it's a good point that Robert makes. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, you know, there, there's multiple non-technology ways to get people involved from posters, uh, you know, awareness days, having people in different departments that are uh, security champions and, and you know, will we'll maybe socialize messaging uh, in either geographical areas or particular departments. Um, and, I, and I also feel that if you come back to, I, I had never heard of this see Shanti song um, it, 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 until Robert told me about it. And, I think a lot of people uh, of my age would maybe not know what it's about, but if you mix and match the types of output, um, and again, just don't go for one uh, genre of people, um, I, I think people automatically know that you're trying. They gauge the importance of this issue to, to the organization. I also feel the more that you can have your own corporate branding uh, your CEO talking to them about this, um, having regular uh, check-ins by way of all hands uh, meetings and stuff like that, that it's a regular par part. Really what you're trying to do is um, bake it into your DNA. That takes a long time, admittedly, but it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Coming on to our next point in a way, you know, um, characters, uh, again, I, I introduced you as heroes. Characters, people relate to people. 
don't they, in stories and also in cyber security awareness campaigns and in any kind of communication. So um, those strategies, what can you recommend to best cast your characters in your cyber storytelling? You mentioned you mentioned CEOs. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, maybe finding those um, those champions within the organisation who maybe already have a rapport with uh, with the workforce. I think the exact level is for me the the critical piece. Um, everyone looks to them to set the tone. Uh, I think one of the most toxic. Uh, situations in a, in a cybersecurity or a compliance environment is where you have a senior exec who is known to be dismissive of those initiatives. It's just a cancer. You, you, you have a major problem on your hands because people will, will say, well, if it's okay for him to do it, why is it okay for me to do it? He's getting his secretary to take the training. Why should I spend all this time taking, taking the training? The reality is uh, since March of last year, uh, cyber criminals have switched their attention from mass attacks um, on the general population to specific attacks on companies and actually targeted at their exec levels. So not only are they the uh, vector of, of, the, of the most scrutiny from uh, m- uh, mal actors, but they are the people that need the training the most. So it's a virtuous circle. I think you have to then realize they more than anybody need messaging that resonates with them, uh, resonates to their status and, and, and the um, role that they have in, in, in making sure that everybody takes this seriously. Um, so like if you were just to go and do a, a really thorough education campaign with your executives, I guarantee it would move the needle in the organization even if you told no one else, just their behaviors would change. Uh, And if you change their behaviors, it'll cascade down through. So I think those guys are the key characters in in, in your role and even getting them to participate and play parts, uh, whatever they may be, um, you know, handing out, uh, you know, giveaways or whatever with the Mm. cyber awareness day on it or, that, that just speaks to people of commitment. And I think that's the thing that is the driver behind a really successful initiative like this. We are well into the final chapter, maybe even the epilogue, uh, I'm afraid, gentlemen. Uh, so just to make sure that we do get our fairy tale ending, uh, tell me about some useful next steps or resources that you recommend for those who are planning their cybersecurity awareness uh, programs over the next 12 months who might want to give it a little bit of character. Robert. Happy to report, David, that on our website at www.metacompliance.com, there is a healthy library of free resources, um, Mm -hmm. posters, screensavers, cyber cyber newsletters. So for anyone out there thinking about getting started on this, there's a lot of really good off-the-shelf collateral that that is there to be downloaded and and used at their convenience. Great. Robbie? Well, we have a a playbook of best practices um, from you know, over 10 years of, of working with organizations of how you go do this, um, really very simply written, almost as, as, a, as a, um, a way to explain to other people, this is how we're going to um, do an awareness campaign and get that executive back in. And it's called uh, Cybersecurity Awareness for Dummies. And, and likewise, if you reach out to us, we'll send you a physical book. Um, it, it is actually something that you can pass around uh, internally, and it maybe just turns down the seriousness and the, the, the boring aspect and tries to make it a bit more fun. Super stuff. Uh, listen, Robbie, Robert, as always, it's been a, a pleasure to chat with you both today. Thank Thanks you, very much, David. And thank you to everyone joining us today. Uh, stay safe wherever you are. And that is the end of our story today. Bye for now.